A subwoofer is a great way to add more bass to your system, but how do you even go about doing that? What subwoofer should you buy? Where should you put it? How do you set it up? So first, why should you get a subwoofer? The reason is that the vast majority of studio monitors, especially more budget-oriented ones, can't produce super low frequencies. The bottom end of a monitor's range usually ends around 50 to 125 hertz, depending on the size of the woofer. That can be problematic for just about every type of audio work besides vocals. A standard four-string bass can go down to about 41 hertz. If you're doing hip-hop or electronic music production, synthesized bass sounds can go even lower. For sound design, 80 hertz is often the highest sound that is utilized in the low-frequency effects channel. We'll talk more about that later on. All this means that you really need a subwoofer to supplement your stereo monitors in order to be able to effectively hear and mix your bass and sub-bass frequencies. Now that doesn't mean you should just go out and buy a subwoofer immediately. Unless all three of your room's mixing dimensions are at least 17 feet or so, the dimensions will resonate at audible bass frequencies, creating an un even and unpredictable low-end response. You need to address those issues with acoustic treatment before you try to add a sub, otherwise you might not even hear a difference. The upside is once your room is acoustically treated, you might be happy with the bass response of your monitors, even without adding a sub. Acoustic treatment is too large of a topic to cover here, but I'll link some resources in the description. All right, so you've got a room with the bass frequencies treated, your monitors still aren't going low enough to make you happy, what sub should you buy? Well, most studio manufacturers also sell a subwoofer that's specifically designed to be paired with their monitors. Yamaha, Mackie, JBL, Personas, Atom, Focal, KRK, Kali, Genelec, Behringer, and Neumann all make paired subwoofers. So if you have a monitor from one of those manufacturers, it would be best to buy a matching subwoofer. If you don't have monitors from one of those manufacturers, or the matching subwoofer is too expensive, you can go with a home theater sub as a substitute. I have a Yamaha home theater subwoofer in my system, and it actually sounds really good. Try to look for reviews and see if anyone has used the sub in a pro setup before and what their thoughts were. Okay, so now you've got a sub, how do you hook it up? Well, there's actually three ways, and what you do will depend on what you're working on. Those three setups are three-way, LFE, and bass managed. Three-way is the most common setup, and it's what you'll do if you're working on music or other stereo content. In this setup, the output from your interface will be fed into a crossover. The crossover will split the low frequencies and send them to the subwoofer, and send the high frequencies to the monitors. Generally, the crossover will be set based on where the response of your monitors starts to drop off. You can buy a dedicated crossover unit, but fortunately, the vast majority of subwoofers have a crossover built in. In that case, you feed the output of your interface into the sub, and the sub will have outputs that go to your monitors. You can generally adjust the crossover frequency. Often the manuals for your monitors will specify what that crossover should be. LFE, or low frequency effects, is the setup you'll use if you're mixing surround sound content, or content for a theater release. LFE is a dedicated channel with 10 dB of extra gain to support the other speakers in a surround sound or theater environment. Because it's a dedicated channel, you need a dedicated output going to your subwoofer, so you need at least three outputs on your interface, two for your monitors and one for the subwoofer. The last option is bass management. Bass management is a blend between LFE and three-way setups where your sub still gets a dedicated channel, but it also gets the bass frequencies from the other channels, effectively giving you the best of both worlds. You still need a third dedicated output on your interface, but you also need some kind of bass management system. There are hardware options, but they tend to be very expensive. You can also buy plugins like Waves 360 that do the bass management on the master bus of your DAW. A lot of sound professionals nowadays prefer to mix on an LFE system without bass management, but it's still a good idea to check any mixes you do on a bass managed system, even if it's just a home theater setup where the bass management is being handled by a receiver. The reason is that bass content in your main channels can be out of phase with your LFE content, causing frequency loss when the channels are combined and sent to the subwoofer. It's also worth noting that your LFE channel can't contain information above 125 hertz when encoded in a format like Dolby Digital for distribution. Consumer systems may also filter all LFE information above 80 hertz. For those reasons, make sure you check your mix with different output configurations. Okay, you've set up your subwoofer, you got it hooked up you know, how you want. Now, where should you put it? Well, there's two schools of thought in this regard, and I'll explain both. 
First is the loud school of thought, and the second is the accurate school of thought. Loud is about making the subwoofer as loud as possible. This is generally the approach when you have a cheaper subwoofer that isn't very powerful, or when the room you're in isn't acoustically treated. When you place a sound producing object against a solid surface, you're having the area it can radiate sound into. That means you get 3 dB of extra gain, which is about one press of the volume button on your phone. When you place the subwoofer against two surfaces along an edge, you get 6 dB of gain. If you throw it in a corner where three walls meet, you've achieved 9 dB of gain, which sounds about twice as loud to the human ear. Great, so what's the downside? Well, there's actually a lot. Remember those acoustic room modes I talked about earlier? Well, all room modes meet in corners, which means placing your subwoofer in one is exciting all room modes, giving you the worst possible frequency response. Having the sub in a corner also usually means it's much farther from you than your monitors are, which means you can get phase cancellation in the crossover region between your monitors and sub. A lot of subs have phase and polarity controls to deal with this, but that can still cause smearing, where sound information is spread across the time domain. The last issue comes from building construction. If the room you're in has drywall or plywood construction, the cavities behind the surface will act as a diaphragmatic absorber. In short, removing frequency information at a specific resonant frequency depending on the weight of the surface material and the size of the gap. Having your subwoofer sitting against that type of construction can cause big losses in certain frequencies. You can minimize that effect by insulating behind the surface, which will dampen any resonances, reducing and evening out the frequency losses, but it won't help with the other issue. Also, when you have a sub sitting against the floor or wall, you're transferring base content directly into the building frame. Not ideal if you have any roommates or neighbors. The alternate approach fixes all these issues and gives you a much cleaner and more accurate sound. The first step is to get your subwoofer in phase with your monitors, which means raising it up to the same level with a stand of some sort and having it the same distance away. You don't want to stand with an enclosed hollow space as that will resonate and alter the response of your sub. Solid wood is a good way to go. Next, you want to acoustically decouple your subwoofer so sound isn't transferred directly into the stand and into the floor. There are dedicated products designed for this, but I've just used a piece of one inch upholstery foam and that's worked fine. This will significantly reduce frequency loss from sound cavities in your wall and floor and reduce the amount of sound going into the building frame and being carried to other rooms. Like I said earlier, you want the subwoofer the same distance away as your monitors so they remain in phase. At first glance, the logical place to do this would be halfway between your monitors, but that's generally not ideal. The reason is that if your listening position is correctly placed, having the subwoofer directly in front of you means having it halfway between your sidewalls, which also means heavily exciting that room mode. That's also where your center channel belongs in a surround system. For those reasons, it's better to go slightly off center, but still somewhere between your two monitors. I should point out that most professional setups aren't done the same as my accurate setup, Due to practical issues like the size of the subs, it's often easier to go against the rear wall on the floor. Still, you should try to keep placement between your stereo speakers and roughly the same distance from your listening position. Regardless of where your subwoofer is and how you set it up, make sure that the front of the subwoofer is aimed towards you, and if the subwoofer has a port, don't aim the port towards a wall. Technically, subwoofers radiate sound pretty much omnidirectionally, but you do get slightly more detailed response from the front and having the port aimed at a wall will make it pretty much useless. So you've bought your subwoofer, you've hooked it up and got it placed where it needs to be, which brings us to the last and most important step in adding a subwoofer to your setup, calibration. To calibrate your system, you need some kind of calibration microphone. Ideally, that would be an omnidirectional small diaphragm condenser that's designed for measurement. You can pick one up for less than $70 from Sonarworks. Mine is a bit more expensive and comes from DBX. If you don't own one already, you can get decent results with any kind of small diaphragm condenser. Just make sure it doesn't have a low frequency cut. You'll also need an SPL meter. If you don't own one like me, you can use one on your phone. It won't be the most accurate thing in the world, but it should be fairly close. I'm using the SPL in FFT app on iOS. It's not the most intuitive thing in the world, but it is fairly accurate and has all the tools we need. You want your SPL meter set to C weighting and slow response. Grabbing some hearing protection isn't a bad idea either, as the constant pink noise can get really loud and obnoxious after a while. Start by turning off your subwoofer, placing your SPL meter where your head would be when listening, 
and playing a pink noise signal through your speakers. Any audio program should be able to generate pink noise. In this case, I'm using Reaper. Attenuate the noise so it's peaking at negative 20 dBFS, which is equivalent to zero VU. Pan the noise hard right or left so it's only playing through one channel of the system. At this point, the idea is to adjust the level of your interface, amplifier, or monitor until you reach a target level. When mixing for cinema, that target is 85 dB SPL. For television, the target is generally between 79 and 82 dB SPL. Music tends to be much louder on average, so you want a lower calibrated level of 70 to 80 dB SPL, depending on the size of your room and what's comfortable for you. Once you've calibrated one speaker, make sure all other full range speakers in your system match. If you have a surround system, there's a few other steps in calibration, but that's for another video. Now ditch the SPL meter and put your measurement mic in the same spot. Aim the mic towards the center point between your stereo speakers. Even if the mic is omnidirectional, where you're aiming it does make a slight difference. Run the mic into a real-time analyzer. If you don't have a dedicated hardware unit, which odds are you don't, you can just use a frequency analyzer plugin on the input of your DAW. With pink noise playing through the monitors, you should see a flat line of noise in the analyzer with a drop off in the bass frequencies, assuming that your monitors, room acoustics, and microphone are perfectly flat, of course. Take note of the approximate level the speakers are at across the frequency spectrum above the drop off. Now turn off your speakers and turn on your subwoofer. You wanna filter out the higher frequencies from going to your subwoofer, so you need to put a low pass filter on your pink noise. If you're using a three-way or bass managed setup, set the filter to be the same as your crossover frequency. If you're using a dedicated LFE channel only, set the filter to 120 Hz. Using your RTA, adjust the level of the sub until it's at a consistent level relative to your main channels. For music content, you want your subwoofer to be at the same level as your monitors, and for film and television content, you want the subwoofer to be 10 dB louder. And that's it. You've successfully added a professionally calibrated and configured subwoofer to your setup. So anyway, that's it for this video. If you hit the if you like this video, hit the like button. If not, feel free to hit the dislike button. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave those down in the comment section down below. And if you want to see more videos, including, for example, an upcoming video on how to set up and calibrate a 5.1 system, definitely hit that subscribe button.